Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining for our talk on the evolution of IO or immuno-oncology therapies across the urothelial carcinoma treatment landscape. Um, if after the presentation you are interested in learning a bit more about immuno-oncology in this treatment setting, please feel free to visit our Bristol-Myers Squibb booth. If you walk out of here, it's towards the right by the residence pavilion. Um, but without further ado, I wanted to introduce you to our two esteemed speakers. So we have Dr. Kareem Shami, who is a urologist and um, an associate professor of urology at UCLA, and Dr. Olka Veshampayan, who is a medical oncologist and a professor of uh, medicine and oncology at University of Michigan. So I'll invite them on stage and pass it off to them. Thank you. I'll see, I'm gonna give you a little more time for people to find, um, time to find a seat because it's pretty hard to get a seat in here, so. <laughs> All right, so, um, so obviously it's an honor to be up here with uh, Olka, who's uh, a thought leader in the management of patients with uh, urothelial cancer. And today we'll be talking about um, the muscle invasive setting and we'll be talking about the metastatic setting. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to comment on the fact that I think it's really important that uh, Bristol Myers has engaged urologists and is here at the AUA uh, because I think they realize the importance of urologists in the management of patients with urothelial cancer um, because we are ultimately the bottleneck. And for a long time, the utilization of chemotherapy, neoadjuvant chemotherapy was low because urologists would, would oftentimes perform upfront cystectomies. And with more and more level one data, the urologists are actually referring patients to medical oncology, and we're starting to see the field blossom and develop. So uh, no further ado, let's go on to the next slide. Um, obviously, we're going to be talking about Opdivo, uh, which is also called nivolumab as a single agent, which is FDA approved for the management of patients with urothelial carcinoma at high, uh, high risk of recurrence, and as well as in the metastatic setting with um, uh, unresectable disease in combination with gemcitabine and cisplatin. Um, nivolumab is an immunotherapeutic agent which is associated with immune-mediated immune adverse events, um, infusion-related reactions, complications with allogeneic uh, therapies, and uh, embryo-fetal toxicities. Um, this is me, and I'm obviously, like I said, honored to be here with, with Olka, who's a professor of medical oncology at University of Michigan and home of the national champions. So um, today I'll be talking about the 274 data to support how eligible patients with muscle invasive bladder cancer um, who are at high risk of recurrence after radical cystectomy or radical nephroureterectomy may benefit from adjuvant therapy. Olka is going to be talking about the Checkmate 901 data to demonstrate um, patients who are eligible with unresectable disease and how they may benefit from combination of Nevo plus uh, gemcitabine and cisplatin. Uh, we'll talk about the importance of a multidisciplinary team between medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, and urologists, and then we'll review some patient cases that apply to each scenario. So uh, 274. So the Checkmate 274 data has been presented previously, but there's some important updates in this presentation that we hadn't talked about before. Um, so upfront, patients with muscle invasive urothelial carcinoma, um, there's, you know, it's the fourth most common cancer in men and it's the most seven most common cancer overall. There's about 83,000 new cases and 20% um, of new cases are muscle invasive and an additional 5% uh, show up with metastatic disease. Uh, neoadjuvant cisplatin-based chemotherapy followed by radical resection is the gold standard for muscle invasive disease. And we think that it probably is gonna be the gold standard for upper tract urothelial carcinoma as well. Um, <clears throat> although neoadjuvant chemotherapy and radical resection is associated with improved survival, there's a high risk of recurrence, and it's up to 50% within two years. And we think that um, adjuvant therapies have been oftentimes underutilized because we, don't really ha we haven't really had level one data to demonstrate their evidence and their support. And we think that 
things that may benefit the uh, utilization of, um, of adjuvant therapies are really kind of risk stratifying patients who are at high risk of recurrence. And those are patients who really didn't have a great response after neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So if they've had muscle invasive disease at, at the time of radical cystectomy despite neoadjuvant chemotherapy, if they have lymph node positive disease uh, at, the, after, um, at the time of cystectomy, or if they never had neoadjuvant therapy but they had T3 disease or higher, uh, those patients would, would benefit from adjuvant therapy. And if you actually look at patients with upper tract disease, we have uh, evidence to suggest, based on the POUT study, that um, adjuvant uh, platinum-based chemotherapy may benefit patients who are at high risk of recurrence. And we know that chemotherapy delays recurrence and improves um, overall survival for patients with upper tract disease. So we have a potential high risk of recurrence despite neoadjuvant chemotherapy and radical resection. We have significant morbidity either before radical resection and after radical resection. We know that um, many patients may not be eligible for neoadjuvant chemotherapy because they have poor renal function, they may have um, neuropathy, they have existing hearing loss, and may not be eligible for uh, uh, splatin-based chemotherapy. Sometimes uh, patients who undergo radical cystectomy had, have significant morbidity after their surgery. They develop uh, chronic kidney disease and um, uh, acute kidney injury after their cystectomy, which, which precludes them from getting um, uh, adjuvant chemotherapy. And so there is this unmet need because not all patients will be eligible for getting it before, and some patients aren't getting it afterwards. So as urologists, you know, th there's a number of performance tests, right? I mean, there's ECOG, there's Kar Karnofsky, and they all kind of quantify performance um, and, and you know, whether someone is eligible for radical resection. As urologists, as surgeons, we have something called the ET, which stands for the eyeball test. And if you walk into a patient's room and you look at this patient and they don't pass the eyeball test, you don't have to quantify their ECOG or their performance scale. You can just look at them and say, I don't think this guy is eligible for, for radical resection. So as a surgeon, we look into, we've, we've, when we first meet the patient, we have to see whether they pass that eyeball test. And that eyeball test is, is this someone who I think I can perform a radical cystectomy or radical nephroureterectomy in, in a safe manner? And that's kind of dependent upon a number of factors. Um, and once we determine whether they're eligible for surgery, we then have to determine whether they're eligible for neoadjuvant chemotherapy and so forth. So what are some things that determine whether they're eligible for surgery? Well, obviously, one important thing is um, their disease stage. If this is someone who comes in with locally advanced disease, and you're, and you're unlikely to be able to render them cancer-free because they either have metastatic disease or they have local extension to the you know, pelvic sidewall and to the colon and some of the surrounding structures, then this is not someone who's, I think, highly, um, a, who's probably a very good candidate. Um, second is uh, patient comorbidities and patient age. Um, I think age is an important biomarker. Um, there are some exceptions. I've done a cystectomy on a 95-year-old, and I've deferred a cystectomy on a 65-year-old. The 95-year-old after cystectomy lived another five years, and then my 65-year-old patient that I deferred a cystectomy lived another two months. So age is important, but comorbid conditions play a significant role. Um, and I think, you know, we as, as surgeons kind of are used to that, and we kind of know whether someone's eligible or not based on their age, their comorbid conditions, and their tumor uh, burden. But one other important factor is social support. You know, I've had patients who can't even make their appointments because they don't have the support mechanisms to make, to make an operation, to, to come in for their operation or come in for the follow-up visit. So social support is an, an important biomarker. Now. Once we determine that someone is eligible for surgery, we have to determine whether they're eligible for neoadjuvant th chemotherapy or not. And um, obviously, I'm not the expert on this, but I will tell you that you know, things that I think play an important role in determining eligibility for, for neoadjuvant chemotherapy is performance status. So usually, they have to have ECOG performance of 0, 1. Sometimes 2 is you know, OK. Um, 
age, I think, plays a role. Uh, kidney function, so people usually like to have a GFR above 50 or so to kind of be eligible for new adjuvant chemotherapy. And, you know, whether they have any kind of um, uh, neuropathy or, or, or other comorbidities which preclude them from getting new adjuvant therapy. Um, if a patient has poor renal function or has, you know, significant um, peripheral neuropathy or has poor performance status that precludes them from getting new adjuvant chemotherapy, then we can go down the upfront cystectomy route and then offer these patients um, adjuvant um, immunotherapy later. But if they are eligible for new adjuvant chemotherapy, we preferably like to have them get some um, chemotherapy in their bloodstream before we operate on them. And once we operate on these patients, they come back and see us, and we then have to determine what to do with these patients. So obviously we have the option of giving these patients um, uh, adjuvant chemotherapy or adjuvant nivolumab. The adjuvant uh, chemotherapy is based on data that has been presented by Cora Sternberg and showing some benefit from adjuvant chemotherapy. But um, adjuvant nevo, I think, probably has more robust data, and you know, we have a phase three placebo-controlled trial which shows uh, benefit in disease-free survival. So those are our two treatment options. Obviously, that's gonna be, that decision's gonna be made by the medical oncologist, the urologist, and the patient. And I think it's important that you integrate all those uh, healthcare providers and the patient in the decision-making process. Now, uh, the 274 st study, and I'm here to talk about, uh, you know, the, the study in greater detail, um, was, was a pl uh, phase three placebo control trial where patients had to have had either neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and they must have had residual muscle invasive disease, or they must have had lymph node positive disease, or if they didn't get neoadjuvant chemotherapy, which is about 60% of patients, um, they must have had you know, uh, T3 disease or greater or node positive disease at the time of cystectomy. Um, these patients must have had radical resection within 120 days, and they must have been disease free within four weeks of entry into the trial. Their performance status must have been zero or one if they've had neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and they were allowed to have a performance status of two if, um, if, if they didn't get upfront uh, uh, chemotherapy, but they had upfront cystectomy. We had about 700 patients, and they were randomized 50 to 50, either uh, nivolumab, 240 milligrams every two weeks, or placebo, IV every two weeks. Uh, the cohort was stratified by PDL1 status, uh, prior chemotherapy, and nodal status, whether they're node positive and or whether they had more than 10 lymph nodes removed. Um, they were treated for a year or until uh, recurrence or they were unable to tolerate it. And then the primary endpoint was disease-free survival that was determined by the uh, investigator in all randomized patients, but they also looked at it amongst patients who had high pdl one status. They also looked at secondary endpoints, which was overall survival and non-urothelial tract recurrence-free survival. Their uh, exploratory endpoints were uh, metastasis-free survival, um, uh, PFS, and health-related quality of life. So um, the cohort is, represents what we see um, in the muscle invasive setting where we have about um, uh, median age of about 65 years, three quarters of the patients tend to be men, um, nearly half the cohort was from Europe, and, um, and about a quarter of it was from Asia. Um, most of the patients had uh, ECOG zero performance status, um, and only two and a half patients, two and a half percent of patients had ECOG two. Um, Eighty percent of patients had muscle invasive bladder cancer, and about twenty percent had upper tract urothelial cancer. Uh, an important thing about this is that upper tract urothelial carcinoma only makes up about five or six percent. Of, of all urothelial carcinomas, but it makes up a greater proportion of muscle invasive disease and even makes up a greater proportion of metastatic disease. So even though we think of urothel, upper tract urothelial carcinoma as being a rare disease, they do make up a higher percentage of the more advanced uh, patients. Um, variant histology, minor variant histology, so less than 50% variant histology was found in about 40% of patients. Uh, PDL1 was um, 
high PDL1 status was found at about 40%, which is important, which means that about 60% of patients had PDL status, uh, PDL1 status less than 1%. Um, node positive disease was found in about 47% of patients, which is, which is a significant number. And then 43% of patients received prior neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Now, um, he, these patients had a, a minimum of 31 and a half months of follow-up period. And if you look at the DFS, the disease-free survival, you'll see that the um, disease-free survival for patients who underwent uh, nivolumab therapy, or Obdivo, had statistically significant improved DFS survival. So at six months, it was um, 75% versus 60%. And at a year, it was 63% versus 46%. And this translates to a hazard ratio of 0.7. If you look at patients who have PDL1 status greater than 1%, it's even more profound. Um, 75 months at six months for the Obdivo arm and 56% for the placebo arm. And at, and at a year, it was 67% versus 46% and the hazard ratio was 0.55. So that means that there was a 45% relative risk reduction in um, disease for survival for Obdivo versus placebo. And all this is statistically significant. Um, if you actually look at more extended follow-up, um, this is kind of you know, the take-home message, is that the median disease for survival was basically doubled in those that had Obdivo. So it was around 22 months versus 11 months for Obdivo versus placebo arm. Um, and if you actually look at this, if you actually look at overall survival, and this is kind of new, this was presented uh, recently um, at a, a European conference where overall survival in the intent to treat analysis was statistically significant. So um, patients who had Obdivo had a 24% decreased risk of dying of cancer compared to the placebo arm. And this was statistically significant. And this is one of the few studies you'll ever see in, in the adjuvant setting for muscle invasive disease. So this is really, really important data. So um, a 20-month overall survival advantage, um, median overall survival advantage for Obdivo versus uh, placebo. Um, if you look at the non Urothelial tract recurrence free survival. So, this is an important uh, endpoint, and this is a really important one. And the reason this is important is that um, what you really care about is non urothelial recurrences. So, you know, someone would say, look, if you could do a radical nephroureterectomy on these patients, and we know that 40 to 60% of these patients will ultimately develop bladder cancer. Is that really an important? recurrence free survival advantage. Do we really care about that? You know, we could put some chemotherapy in the bladder and we could potentially decrease that. So the important point of measuring non urothelial tract recurrence free survival is to really talk about these are patients who have recurrences outside the urinary tract. So lymph node, visceral organs, um, sidewall. So that's what we're really talking about. And if you actually look at metastasis free survival, again, you see that the hazard ratios don't really change that much, 0 0.2, 0 0.72, 0 0.74. So we're talking about a 25% relative risk reduction in non-urothelial non tract recurrence-free survival and metastasis-free survival. And these are both statistically significant. Um, as far as serious adverse reactions, 30% um, of patients uh, who received Opdivo developed serious adverse reactions, most commonly found as uh, urinary tract infections, uh, but there is a 1% uh, risk of pneumonitis and, and potential death from that. Um, common adverse reactions, um, the big ones are rash, diarrhea, uh, fatigue, and pruritus. Um, you can also get some musculoskeletal pain and urinary tract uh, infections. Uh, there were dose delays in about a third of patients, and about 18% of patients, it had to be discontinued. So 82% of patients were um, able to complete therapy. Now, Let's talk about the um, onset of um, immune-mediated adverse reactions. So the big ones are pneumonitis, which occurred in about 5% of patients, um, di uh, diarrhea and colitis, which occurred in 4%, hepatitis in 3%, uh, endocrinopathies occurred in about you know, uh, 
anywhere from 1% to 11%. Um, nephritis and renal dysfunction occurred in about 2%, and rash occurred in 11%. Now, this kind of sounds scary, but let's talk about what percent of those actually resolved. So 71% of patients who had pneumonitis had resolution. 93% of patients who had diarrhea and colitis had resolution. 90% uh, of patients who had hepatitis had resolution. Um, about 45% of patients who had hypothyroidism and thyroiditis had resolution. 87% and a half patients who had um, hyperthyroidism had resolution. And about 57% of renal dysfunction and 75% of patients with rash had resolution. And the resolution varied from days to months, but the vast majority had resolution. Here is a case um, of a 71-year-old man who presented in May of 22 with gross hematuria. He had an ultrasound done in the emergency room, which showed a bladder mass. He went to an outside physician who um, did a TURBT. And the, at the time of TURBT, he found a five centimeter sessile mass um, in the lateral sidewall. This was resected. He was then referred to, um, to a medical center where the patient underwent staging. And it's important that you get staging of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. Now, this patient couldn't get a CT scan because he had decreased kidney function, so he had an MRI of the chest, abdomen, pelvis, which showed no evidence of metastatic disease. This patient was not eligible to get neoadjuvant chemotherapy because his GFR was 41 and his creatinine was 1.7. And so he opted to undergo upfront radical cystectomy in an ileal conduit. He had an ileal conduit because he's not a good candidate for an orthotopic neobladder secondary to his uh, chronic kidney disease. At the time of cystectomy, this procedure was performed with comp without complications. He was found to have a three and a half centimeter um, muscle invasive tumor that was invading into the fat and microscopic fat involvement. So it was T3A, but he had two of 17 lymph nodes that were positive. So he was T3A and 1. So obviously, this patient is at significant risk of recurrence. So he was referred to medical oncology. His creatinine did uh, drop a little bit. Uh, it w his creatinine went up a little bit, so his kidney function dropped a little more. And the decision was made to give, offer this patient um, adjuvant immunotherapy with nivolumab. He completed 12 months of therapy. The procedure was tolerated well. He had treatment uh, interruptions secondary to a rash, but he was quickly uh, resumed and they didn't need to start steroids. He had a scan of the chest, abdomen, pelvis every three months, and he had lab work, CBC, Chem 20, vitamin B12, urine cytology while he was on treatment on a quarterly basis, and he had no evidence of metastatic or local recurrence. He's 19 months post-resection and he remains NED. So, to summarize, um, muscle invasive urethral carcinoma with curative intent, obviously with neoadjuvant chemotherapy, is of significant um, importance. However, patients do still do develop recurrences and are at high risk of developing recurrences. I think that Opdivo and nivolumab can reduce the risk of recurrence. Um, at, the, at the primary endpoint, of, uh, based on Checkpoint 274 data, we demonstrate a disease-free survival and overall survival for patients who have had uh, nivolumab compared to uh, placebo. Um, uh, this, I think, underscores the importance of adjuvant immunotherapy um, as a standard of care for patients at high risk of recurrence. And I think it's important that we're giving a talk here at the UA, AUA because urologists have an important role as a primary member of the multidisciplinary team in the management of patients with muscle invasive disease. And with that, I'd like to pass the mic to Olka. Thank you. Good afternoon. And uh, it's my pleasure to be here and talk to you about some of the exciting new advances in unresectable or metastatic urothelial cancer. We'll be talking about the treatment landscape. I just want to say as a background, you know, cisplatin-based chemotherapy has been sort of our uh, pretty much our existence in urothelial cancer as the systemic therapy go-to. Now, the reality was as we have more and more elderly patients, patients with comorbid conditions with the urothelial cancer, about two-thirds of our patients never qualified for that one systemic chemotherapy we could give them. 
So immunotherapy came along, it did change, and it at least gave these metastatic patients an option that they could be considered for. The response rate, though, was about 20%, and it was all in single-arm phase two trials that had already either failed chemotherapy or even if they were not eligible for chemotherapy. The other point that I want to make as background is PDL1 status. You know, a lot of other tumors, we have PDL1 positivity as a predictor of uh, outcome. And somehow in urothelial cancer, whether patients were PDL1 positive or negative, they have tended to have a benefit. So that is not a required test for patients who are being considered for immunotherapy with the uh, metastatic or even in the adjuvant setting, for that matter, with the uh, urothelial cancer. So that, those two points sort of make it essential for us to now con consider optimizing the treatment further. You know, we had the immunotherapy, immune checkpoint therapy used in the advanced setting where patients either didn't qualify for platinum or post-chemotherapy failures. But now, how do we optimize that and improve the outcomes and get the treatment at the right time? And that is where the new data from the Checkmate 901 comes in. So aggressive disease, this is a very aggressive disease. You know, almost everyone, this uh, is a terminal, incurable condition. So when patients have metastatic urothelial cancer, that is bad news all around. Five-year relative survival rates, as you can see up there, 8% or so. Now, hopefully, they will change as we have more and more follow-up with some of these newer treatments coming along. So with the advent of iotherapy, antibody drug conjugates, targeted agents, the treatment landscape has been evolving pretty rapidly. So here is frontline metastatic urothelial cancer. Previously, our uh, definition was cis-eligible versus cis-ineligible. And these were some of the cis-eligible uh, things that you know, patients had adequate creatinine clearance, usually about 50 to 60 was by convention used as the cutoff, ML per minute. And then there were a couple of different options. So you could just do chemotherapy, uh, and in recent years, though majority of us have been using four cycles of chemotherapy, assuming patients have benefit, then we uh, switch over to the switch maintenance regimen, like it's called. For the cis ineligible patients, those were patients we used directly with immune checkpoint therapy. There was an arm looking at upfront just immune checkpoint therapy in all comers, and what was noted is that there you really need to make sure if the patients have PDL1 uh, testing because that arm, if you're considering single agent immune checkpoint therapy, thinking the patient cannot get any possible chemotherapy because of their comorbid conditions or whatever then you should run the PDL1 testing and consider it, them only if they're PDL1 positive. Now, of course, there is a, a antibody drug conjugate plus immune checkpoint therapy, then fortumab plus pembrolizumab combination that is approved in uh, all frontline metastatic urothelial cancer. So these are some of the unmet needs. These patients are fairly sick, very usually are symptomatic from their disease, from renal failure, from obstruction, from pain, et cetera, pelvic pain typically, or if they have liver mats, you know, they have constitutional symptoms. So there is a huge need for effective and safe treatment options, and hopefully we can get to that curative stage and improve survival, at least in these uh, incurable patients. So multidisciplinary care does come in, especially in the patient case scenario where you're looking to sort of balance the quality of life and, uh, uh, and the overall efficacy of the agent. So you have to consider how can you limit the duration of chemotherapy because you know giving chemotherapy month after month can be very draining, especially for these elderly patients with urothelial cancer and with quite a bit of uh, other comorbid conditions. So, you know, definitely think about radiation palliation for different metastatic sites, especially bone, spine, et cetera. And then, uh, of course, there is a lot of palliative care that needs to be involved in the management of these patients.
So we're going to summarize Checkmate 901, which is a phase three global study in frontline metastatic or advanced urothelial cancer, which basically did a comparison of cisplatin gemcitabin standard chemotherapy as compared to cisplatin gemcitabin plus Opdivo therapy. So Opdivo was given in the standard flat rate and after the first maximum of six chemotherapy cycles were given in this therapy, and then patients were switched over. If they were continuing to benefit, they were switched over to just the Opdivo maintenance, uh, which was done once a month. A uh, primary endpoint of the study was overall survival, progression-free survival, of course, response rates, et cetera, were also looked at. Uh, these are the baseline characteristics of this randomized study, very well balanced across both arms. If you look at it, whether patients were PDL1 positive or negative, they were eligible. Uh, majority of the patients here, it's about two thirds were PDL1 positive, and one third were negative. Uh, and then this is the primary endpoint of the study. Overall survival significantly improved with the addition of nivolumab or immune checkpoint therapy to cisplatin and gemcitabin chemotherapy. So median survival is 21.7 months and median survival of cisplatin and gemcitabin is about 18 months, pretty consistent with what has been seen uh, previously with this uh, chemotherapy regimen. Progression-free survival also was significantly improved. Uh, you know, again, you can see the curves there. And the interesting thing, I mean, this follow-up is relatively short still, you know, but we are continuing to follow these patients. But what you're seeing is that there may be a tail end on the curve. There may be some proportion of patients who are going into durable remission. And uh, maybe you know, this will continue to be sustained. We'll only have to wait for time to tell us that. OK, so what about response rates? Because you know, this, in the symptomatic patient population, responses do matter. And those were also improved with the addition of immune checkpoint therapy, 57.6% response rate with the addition of Opdivo to CISGEM and 43% uh, with uh, CISGEM only. Uh, there were some CR rates in there also that were seen. And of course, like I said, time will tell if these duration, you know, the remission. So not only did Opdivo have more patients responding to the chemotherapy plus Opdivo combination, but also there was a better chance of durability of re remission that was noted. Uh, here is the uh, independent uh, response review and pretty similar to investigator response review, so no major difference, but duration of response, as you can see, is significantly prolonged with uh, the addition of Opdivo to the SysGEM regimen. What about adverse reactions? I know uh, Kareem already sort of went over the overall adverse reactions. Immune checkpoint therapy basically has a whole set of different adverse reactions than what we expect with chemotherapy. The main, two main things to remember is that the timing can be unpredictable. So it can happen with the first cycle, it can happen with the 10th cycle. So you never know when those are gonna hit and that it can involve any system. It can involve the skin, do our pneumonitis and colitis tend to be the more common ones, but really, you know, thyroid dysfunction as well as hypophysitis, neuritis, all of these system inflammations have been reported. So just as a caution, those are the side effects that are expected, which are very different from chemotherapy. Chemotherapy, usually the first cycle or two, you sort of get a sense of how this patient is going to feel, should you adjust the dose. I would say the third thing, actually, of immune checkpoint therapy is that dose reduction really doesn't make a difference to the toxicity. So you either give it or you hold it. Unlike chemotherapy, where you, you know, reducing the dose does alleviate the immune, uh, the toxicities that are noted. So those are things to remember. You know, there is a small proportion of patients who will get side effects, 
Majority of these are reversible. The quicker you use steroids and immunosuppression, you know, don't wait too long. Don't wait for doing too many testing. A lot of the times it is a clinical diagnosis. If patients have, for instance, uh, diabetes, that might be one scenario where, you know, diabetes patient, you're going to give steroids to try and help uh, reduce their immune uh, flare-up. So immune-related adverse events really do need to be treated very judiciously. You need to monitor for them, need to monitor their kidney function, liver function, transaminitis has been noted with uh, these uh, therapies also. So here is a list of the more common ones, but we sort of discussed it already. Nephritis has been noted. And frequently, the patients, uh, when they're admitted, the ER physician or even the medicine uh, physicians are not going to recognize that. I just had a patient in the hospital with urothelial cancer on immune checkpoint, and she was admitted. Two days later, her family member calls me saying she's in the hospital, and I find that she went in with the hyperglycemia, glucose of 500 plus, and her kidney function, her creatinine was up to like five or six. The nephrologist was consulted and they had planned for a kidney biopsy the next day. So I actually intervened and I said, you know, please start her on steroids, don't worry about the kidney biopsy just yet. And sure enough, within 24 hours, now her, today her creatinine is down to two and you know, she's continuing to improve. So, so I think, Treating this correctly and quickly does make a difference. I had also given them instructions that if she doesn't improve in 24 to 48 hours, we want her to get uh, you know, higher immunosuppression like mycophenolate, infliximab, et cetera. So that is just something to keep in mind about these. But as Kareem presented, 70% of the time they were reversible with steroids only. Uh, patient education. I mean, this is a big deal. You know, patients have to be educated frequently when they go into the emergency room. The ER staff is trained that if you're on immune therapy, giving steroids is a big no-no. Well, not so for immune checkpoint therapy. So that is just something that, uh, you know, more awareness of these immune-mediated uh, reactions will allow us to sort of optimize that therapy, especially since we have more and more cancer patients going on these treatments and benefiting from them. Uh, so recognize them early and treat and intervene quickly. Uh, this is uh, my case that we are going to present. This is a 73-year-old man who presented with gross hematuria, had some back pain. His cysto showed a bladder wall mass that on biopsy showed transitional cell carcinoma with muscularis propria invasion. He had a CT scan for staging, and that showed bladder wall thickening as well as multiple lymph node metastases, both in the pelvis as well as retroperitoneum. Largest lymph node was about 3.5 centimeter. No other visceral areas of metastases. His creatinine is okay. EGFR is about 55, and he has some hypertension, but which is well controlled. Performance status is decent, about one. So for this patient, you know, what are the different treatment options? Clearly, this is stage four disease because of his retroperitoneal adenopathy, et cetera. But this might be a patient where you want to be aggressive with chemoimmunotherapy and assuming, depending on the type of response they get, maybe consider, you know, potentially some kind of local therapy, assuming they are, uh, you know, showing a fairly good response and maintaining performance status. Again, whether you add that local therapy or not clearly is case dependent and very individualized, but at least starting with this maximum of six cycles of chemotherapy and not sticking the patient on chemotherapy for uh, prolonged periods of time may allow you to sort of have that balance of getting adequate response rate and uh, maintaining their quality of life. So patient was started and got uh, chemotherapy with cisplatin gemcitabine along with nivolumab. So this regimen is FDA approved based on the Checkmate 901 uh, trial data that I just showed you. So this strategy has shown overall survival benefit and showed response rates that were improved as compared to chemotherapy alone. So this is what we considered and started this patient on. And like I said, depending on the type of response, 
whether we consider adding local therapy is uh, very much an individualized patient decision. So to summarize, platinum-based chemotherapy has long been considered standard of care for frontline treatment of patients with metastatic urothelial cancer. Outcomes have been limited, and really durable remissions have been few and far between. We just saw the long-term remission rate was like 5 to 8 percent. With the recent approvals of novel combinations, especially chemoimmunotherapy type of combination like the Checkmate 901 study with Obdivo and CisGem, there is a chance of better chance of response rates as well as better chance of potentially longer term remission or durability of remission. Risk of disease progression or death was reduced by 28% as shown in the study with the addition of Abdivo as compared to CISGEM alone. Uh, in CheckPaint 901, there were deep and durable responses that were observed, and uh, of course, median duration of complete response was 37.1 months. So if patients have a response that is complete uh, by radiology, then uh, median duration, how long it lasts, was about three years plus. And, you know, obviously we need much more follow-up to get more mature survival uh, evidence. So the urologist's role, and I will let Kareem have, uh, give us a few comments about this, but I think really what's critical is both medical oncology and urology need to work together for the optimal treatment of these patients, whether it be in the localized, locally advanced setting or potentially in the metastatic setting, as I'm showing you here, uh, there should be that partnership, there should be that back and forth discussion about the patient at different steps as you go through. You know, clearly for the muscle invasive, non-metastatic patients, you need to consider them for neoadjuvant chemotherapy. The point I will make is that after cystectomy, the patients who on the Checkmate 274, whether they got neoadjuvant chemotherapy or did not get it, either way the patients benefited from adjuvant immunotherapy. So considering that kind of multidisciplinary approach with, of course, reviewing pathology and uh, you know, getting radiology involved, radiation oncology, all of those along with palliative medicine, it needs to be a multidisciplinary team approach to take care of urothelial cancer. Thank you for your attention. Um, Olka, great talk. Um, should we have some questions from the audience? Is there anything that you guys, any burning questions that you'd like to ask? <clears throat> if not, I mean, uh, I'll tell you that I think, obviously, it, it's important that uh, Bristol Myers was able to complete the study and demonstrate not only a DFS, but an overall survival advantage. Um, I think the landscape is changing, and I think, you know, for instance, at UCLA, we're having challenges uh, putting patients on nivolumab because I think we've got, so, you know, we've got an embarrassment of riches with clinical trials. And I'd say that only about maybe 20 to 30 percent of our patients get neoadjuvant chemotherapy. The vast majority are enrolled in a trial where they're either enrolled in the Niagara or the Volga or the Morpheus trial, where they're all getting either you know, immunotherapy, an antibody drug conjugate, or a combination. And, you know, um, the B15 study with Merck, initially um, it was patients who were platinum eligible, so they either get neoadjuvant chemotherapy or immunotherapy uh, with, with EV. And even then at the time, we had to modify the protocol to allow patients to get on um, Opdivo. But do you guys have similar challenges with being able to put somebody on nivolumab? Yeah, I mean, I think there are some absolute contraindications, of course, like, uh, you know, severe autoimmune disease, inflammatory bowel disease, or, you know, organ transplant is another one, which are rare. But uh, also, otherwise, I think majority of the patients, no, we are considering. Now there is actually a cooperative group trial called MODERN that is going to be looking at biomarker-based minimal residual disease and then randomize patients to get uh, immunotherapy adjuvantly or not. You know, everyone gets uh, immune checkpoint therapy if they deserve it, if they have min minimal residual disease present. So there is a lot more coming, I feel, for better selection of the patients. 
But uh, yeah, I mean, I think having that balanced discussion of risk-benefit ratio after, uh, after cystectomy becomes more and more critical. Yeah. yeah. Um, how many of you, you know, in the old days, you know, um, I mind me by old days, I'd say 10 years ago, <laughs> there were days, there were data that was published that only about 20% of patients who'd be eligible for neoadjuvant chemotherapy ever get neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Um, Obviously, for the urologists in the room, you know, what proportion of your patients do you refer to new adjuvant chemotherapy? More than 50%, more than 75%, 100%? Yeah. So, I mean, and in, 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 when a patient comes to you from a urologist, you always offer them new adjuvant chemotherapy? Most of the time. There are some patients who just don't qualify for whatever reason, but most of the time, yes. Uh, and, you know, our supportive care has also gotten better and better. So we are able to get them through this chemotherapy somewhat easier than we were, you know, when the first MBAC-type trial data came out. Uh, from the original new adjuvant trial. Yeah. Brian? So for metastatic urethelial carcinoma, with the changing landscape, are we moving imaging up because we have other options? Uh, you mean after they start therapy for metastatic correct, disease? Correct, to assess for response. Uh, not necessarily up. I think a lot of it for the symptomatic patient, if their symptoms improve, I tell them, you know, I really am in no rush to do the scan because, but if they're not going in the right direction, I think doing a scan sooner to try and figure out because if they're progressing, I have other options to offer them and, you know, genomic sequencing, there is FGFR inhibition, there are other things that I would need to consider and that I would rather do sooner rather than later. Great. All right. I think we're out of time, but if you have yeah. any questions, feel free to come up to us and ask us questions, and hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll answer them for you. Thank you. Thank you for your attention.